I'm Jack Fenner. I'm an archaeologist here at ANU in the College of Asia and Pacific with an interest in Mongolia. But today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing a, a different topic uh, related to land reform. And Undarga Sen Dargsen, who is one of the PhD candidates here in the Crawford School at ANU, uh, will be speaking on uh, pasture land reform in Mongolia. I'd like to appreciate and express my thanks to um, Dr. Nanga for inviting me and including me in the um, very special um, gatherings on Mongolia update, along with very experienced and well-known politicians from Mongolia. So thank you so much. And I'm just a student and learning to um, research on the policy aspects of Mongolia, especially on pastoral mention. So I was. I pretty much prepared a PowerPoint and, uh, and I apologize that it might not be really clear, so I try to speak clearly. And um, so looking at the previous uh, speakers, we had a lot of um, general ideas about Mongolia and all kinds of sectors. But on this, uh, this time, it's going to be quite specific because it's, uh, because it's um, research based on a case study and looking, looking at the pastoral and reform in Mongolia. So just brief outline, introduce my research problems, which is quite important, and then background why this research problem is very important, and the research question, methodology, and case study area, and some of the preliminary findings and some conclusions. So the idea of researching this um, issue regarding to uh, pastoral land is pretty much after the um, transition, Mongolia is considered um, open access. So environmental issue was pretty much defined as land degradation. And it was ma mainly considered to be a result of overgrazing. So overgrazing itself is, so it's a, it's a considered aspect. Overgrazing itself is considered as a result of um, collapse of formal institution, which uh, we heard so many times after the colla um, collapse of collective institution and state institutions, there was no support and no regulation of pastoral resource and regulating herders' access to pastoral resource. So that's why Mongolia government, um, with the um, advocacy of international organizations, implemented transition um, structural adjustment package, which included uh, privatization and land reform. So um, both of these um, transitional policies highly uh, prioritized pasture land management, so very much land-based policy. Yet these policies were far away from solving the problems and reducing the overgrazing. It actually created a lot of complexity. So I argue in my thesis and research, actually pastoral land management after the um, transition is not necessarily prioritizing the land issues itself, but it's actually regulating the components of pastoral production management. So when I say pastoral production management, historically, including Mongolian and international academics, and including global pastoralism, Pastoral production management involves three components, major components, land, livestock, labor. So these three aspects are all relevant to each other. It's not only land issue, it's actually a livestock and labor issue. So in order to manage pasture land properly and effectively, regulate the components, these three, these three components together, as well as based on a straight state administrative territory, the idea is there are a lot of initiatives um, introduced to Mongolia to define the property rights, uh, to, to define the property bodies and institutions, which implies that Mongolia doesn't have any property institution or property institution collapsed, which is to be state. So I argue, I had this statement because just a, so okay, you can see much about it, so I'll try to brief it uh, in an efficient way. Historically, Mongolian pasture land management was part of Mongolian pasture production management. And pasture production management was managed 
based on the state territorial administration, historically. So if we divide the history into three major times, feudal time, collective time, and transition time, which is since 1990, feudal time, which we record since um, Mongol Empire, let's say, even before that, it's usually centralized and decentralized regional state run by nobles, and uh, later with, um, along with Buddhist institution, regulating herders' access, access. And then main institutional arrangement was military thousands, or atok later, and then under the Manchu time, it's a Hosho-based administrative territorial, along with pastoral production management, which includes land, labor, and livestock. So this institutional arrangement changed under the collective system, but collective system does not necessarily dismantle the whole aspects of pastoral ma production management, but actually maintained it. So the way it's disintegrated was some territorial administration managed the territorial issues, but state um, designed collective institutions manage the production aspects. But pr collective production management includes land, labor, livestock within some, some level. So this way, even under the socialism, Mongolia managed to adjust its own policy. I mean, this collective policy, which is introduced by Russians, into their own conditions. So that's why Mongolia's, a lot of, a lot, a lot of our speakers were saying, until now, Mongolia is the only one country which has managed to retain this landscape in this way is a lot to do with our own institutional arrangement, which is related to how Mongolians historically manage pastoral production management, not only pastoral land management. So this institutional arrangement changed dramatically under the transition in which some and back territorial administration basically become, becomes in charge of armed territory. And also, according to the new laws, <coughs> it also becomes in charge of land management. So in this case, I, I'm trying to say here um, that pastoral production management now, now disintegrated into land being specifically separately managed under the ter territorial issue, whereas production of um, livestock and labor management, which is a production aspect, is pretty much privatized. So herders are only able to talk about production of, only able to talk about livestock and labor issues, but government or state pretty much lose control of regulating these aspects. So if I say when, you, when these three aspects are supposed to be together under the state territorial institutional arrangement, now it's all separated and land is being under the territorial and the other two aspects are controlled by herders itself, actually individual herding households. So because of these reasons, um, I'll say uh, specific <coughs> policy initiatives here, just to mention. So 1991, privatization of livestock and livestock shelter, which basically means <coughs> herders are becoming in charge of um, production aspects individually. In 1994, <coughs> possession of winter and spring campsites by herding households under the new land law. So which means basically pasture <coughs> land is not necessarily have definite property rights, but herding campsites, this is specifically winter campsites, herders have specific property rights to the, um, um, their camping areas. So the idea is basically to introduce in Mongolia very agrarian-based especially in these cases, very Western-oriented property rights ideas, exclusive property rights ideas. But this idea sort of conflicts with um, this communal public grazing land. And in 1998, because of absence of this um, property rights issue to the pasture land, um, donor organizations, again, through the environmental policy, try to um, create um, herder groups to define the property rights, to define the property bodies. So, which by I mean, by which I mean, um, herders are all individual single households. So they need to have an institution to claim property rights to certain specific areas. And then in 2003, herder group use and production of natural resources were 
articulated in under 2003 amendments of the land law and natural um, law and the environmental protection. In 2007, another policy in its initiatives came. So this time, it's quite national, Mongolian's own policy, which is not necessarily influenced by international organizations. Stab establishment of the state reserve pasture area. It's actually informally very historical um, practice of um, pasture use. And in the collective time, it was formalized by the state. All collectives need to be supported by state institution of reserve pasture enterprise. In 2010, another policy in initiatives came. Again, this time they tried to have separate law on the pasture land. Again, um, including and applying herder group, group possession of pasture land. So I'll take up the individuals. So all the, um, the ideas of all these policies is pretty much based on the initial um, problem definition of Mongolia, which is Mongolia doesn't have any specific property rights. Historically, it's open access. So it sounds like we got a lot of open issues here. That's why I need to define the property rights, define the resource group, define the territorial boundary for that resource group. So I chose to study um, um, historical reserve pasture area, which is located uh, two hours drive well, four hours drive away from um, Ulaanbaatar. So it's Hitlumbayo Lang, which used to be a um, very famous historical reserve pasture area plus collective time state enterprise, which provided all collectives with um, reserve pasture and hay making, for photo making and forage making. And it used to be run by state, not collectives. So I focus on three, three bugs. To, which belong to two different um, provincials annals in order to compare how different territorial and property institutional arrangement they have. Just to make it brief, um, these are very brief findings. It can get a lot more complex, so you can ask more questions at the end, but I'll make it very brief here. So first findings I... Um, I revealed from my research in case study areas. <coughs> so basically I'm arguing with whether Mongolia is open access or not, whether there is absence of property rights or not. So why Mongolia need exclusive individual or communal property rights to, to regulate access to pasture? So I'm arguing basically with these points. And my case study <coughs> pretty much revealed 50% 50, 50 some case open access created, some case it's not open access at all. So essentially maintenance of dual control over pasture land management retained after the transition. Dual control of pasture land, land management I meant by state control and communal control as well. So there was not so much open access created under the transition just because collective institution collapsed. Actually open access created to the collective assets, like wells and livestock shelters, which collective institutes and state enterprises all own. But what herders did was they basically returned to the informal way of using pasture. This is because all Mongolian pasture production management is heavily dependent on weather condition. Seasonal pasture use, rotational pasture use, cross-boundary seasonal visits, these are all dependent on weather condition, which has been developed. All these rules are de developed for hundreds and hundreds of years in Mongolia, not just because of um, tra transition. So once collective and state support um, disappears, herders basically continue um, practicing their um, herding management which basically led them to rely on traditional way of doing it. But this time, it was not as bigger a scale as, as it happened in the collective time, because collective provided with a lot of technological support and management aspects. But this time, it's more like, um, like we know, individual levels. And then also, this informal use, um, Besides this informal use of um, 
past few years, migration is another factor. So loads of migration happened between different um, um, provincials, and then especially to the um, leading towards the um, major urban areas and major reserve, ma major pasture areas. So it's all about access, how to get access to the market and how to get access to good pasture. So you benefit, you increase your benefit. So that's why herders' concentration around productive uh, market areas and pastoral resources pretty much led to reduced mobility. So that's the um, first findings pretty much leading to overgrazing. So repeated use of same pastoral resource in a very small area creates overgrazing. And second findings um, is, so second findings is related to land law. So 1994 land law articulated campsite possession by individual households. So this law is very, very influential in terms of creating negative impacts on how herders use pasture land. So campsite possession becomes the only legal mechanism to secure access to pasture resource. So initially, like I said before, Mongolia had its own very complex property, um, I mean, property um, resource use rights, and um, which is basically to accommodate flexibility and mobility under very unstable weather condition. So this right was informal recognized use rights to campsites, which also allow access to pastoral resources surrounding the campsites. So this access to campsites, which used to be informal recognized use right, is now replaced by legal mechanism of campsite possession. So once you have no access to the campsite position, it's pretty much really hard to get access to surrounding pasture. And then also, um, because of the migration, concentration of campsite increased, and also it's resulted in expansion of campsite possession to the other seasonal pastures. So historically, Mongolian pastoral production management is based on state territorial administration. And under different history, Territorial boundaries shrink a lot. So that's the fundamental issue about Mongolian pasture land management. So more pasture territorial boundary shrinks, less flexibility is accommodated in pursuing mobility in different seasonal pasture. So concentration of campsite and campsite possession to other seasonal pasture, pasture has a very de detrimental impact. So basically, it reduces herders' mobility again. So again, repeated use of pasture. If pasture what used to be, seasonal pasture used to be rota rotated a lot, this time it's not necessarily well rotated. And actually, distances are very much small, increase the number of livestock. So a third policy initiative. <coughs> In my case, I, uh, it's not necessarily have direct impact, but um, it's quite interesting too. <laughs> so community-based natural resource management becomes big, big model in throughout the world in developing countries. Everybody suggested, okay, community needs to be related to conservation. They need to do. They need to do the um, conservation. Okay, another idea is poor people destroy nature, and all these all these things led to okay, community should have their own property rights and invest in the land and protect the environment. That idea also come to Mongolia, and first Ministry of Environment, has, um, environment implemented this um, with the funding of international organization. So community-based natural resource management raises a question of what's community in Mongolia. So for us, community is, again, in my opinion, and also other academics, defined by territorial administration. Bak community, some community, as far as AMA community, even in Mongolia we can call, even in Ulaanbaatar we can call So these are the concept of community for us. But in, in international um, development advocacy needs to define it. So it, has need, it needs to define it more on a territorial base. You need to have a specific group to assign a territory and define the social boundary, 
define the resource boundary. So what they did is defining uh, community as a herder group. So herder group is based on nyugnotoksnihan. So again, I said nyugnotoksnihan is not necessarily a territorial term, but it's actually social networking for facilitating mobility. Again, if you say nyugnotoksnihan, nyugnotkin hotspot in Ulamata, we have people from Hinti, people from us. It's all social networking, but it does not represent territorial social boundary. So that's why this idea was a lot more conflicting with creating a territorial boundary, which again conflicts with territorial administrative boundaries. So there is some issue with if herder group is established in area involving herders from two different blocks, so how are you going to manage that? And how are you going to deal with this different some administration and different bug administrations? And the major issue raised with this herder group is because, for example, um, sustainable uh, natural resource management or UNDP projects or um, S SDC projects, they all had struggled to regulate how incomes of managing. Um, the the um, ex-minister talked about um, charging people for using natural resource, right? <coughs> so, all right, users, sorry. So when visiting herders come to herder group area, they need to talk about pasture use fee. So who's going to be responsible for administering these issues? Is this bug administration, some administration, or is this herder group itself? If it's two um, herder group is composed of two different areas, how are they going to solve this issue? In another issue herder group territory conflicts with is most of the herder group territory is defined by campsite possession. And most of the herder group territory is winter and spring areas. And winter and spring areas, herders possess campsites. So it means basically campsite possession is the legal issue belong to the administrative territory, not group itself. But if you're composed of two diff uh, herders from two different areas, it's a very, very complicated issue to manage this territory as their own. And the third conflicting issue is weather condition. So you have a definite property, resource right, um, social boundary and resource ba boundary of definite herder group areas. But what happens under the unstable changing herding, um, herding practices? Herders need to move, but you can't move as a group. You may arrange it as a group, but under this very scarce resource situation these days, there is no one who wants to accept you with 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 of livestock between different groups. It's actually a bigger matter than herder groups. So matter is usually sold by box, some, and AMOC levels of territorial administration. So historically, it's all about state managing and working with herders in a territorial basis, not just um, some imposed little territorial group, group. And the fourth problem with the herder group is, again, because territorial Territorial administration is shrinking smaller and smaller, and after the transition, pastoral resource also shrunk much because of the infrastructure, so less pasture is accessible because of lack of water and you know, market. In this case, herder group territory becomes much, much smaller, so it's really hard to accommodate flexibility and mobility. And you need to have a flexibility and mobility in herding management in Mongolia because of un unstable weather condition. So you have to be always thinking about ready to move, where to move, men, when to move, who to talk, what kind of connections we have, how many livestock is available, this kind of situation. So findings, last findings on state reserve pasture policy. So this is a great policy for Mongolian herders. The idea is basically to support what I was saying is supporting the herders' production management. So the policy idea was great, and it's based on historical policy practices of Mongolia. Unfortunately, this policy run by Ministry of uh, Agriculture, Food and Agriculture, faces a lot of challenges. This is again because its policy is heavily based on territorial land-based policy rather than 
working with the um, territorial administration and focusing on um, production management. So the first challenge comes with disputes between different territorial agencies. Local administration and ministry. Ministry created um, state, territory, state reserve pasture area, taking some areas from other ter um, territorial administration. But because herders possess campsites in those areas, the pastoral issue becomes the matter of that each, each um, different territorial administration because a state reserve pasture, reserve pasture area administration cannot deal with campsite possessions. And also, each territorial administration loses their territory means it's a big loss for them because of uh, many reasons, mining, resource mining, mining coming to their area, project coming to their area, and herders are their residents, so herders are their assets, so it's, it's pretty much a lot to do with political economy, who, who benefits how using legal state mechanisms. So third issue is ambiguity and authority of different state agencies. It's, um, it's a really complex issue if you get, get into the depth, but one example is pretty much in Hilton Bayoulan case, for example, so Hilton Bayoulan used to be state reserve area and later become just a territorial administration. But because of its old history, it has a less population, and it needs to be um, it needs to maintain certain population number to maintain its village status. But at the same time, which com uh, conflicts with local herders, more migration comes, and local administration allows it. But it conflicts with um, herders from surrounding are areas and local herders. So that's why it led to um, a lot of disputable use of resources, pastoral, pastoral resources, and livestock shelters, and campsite possessions, and created a lot of um, overgrazing issues. So conclusion, basically, overall, my thesis looking at how policy impact on changing herders access. So herders are more reactive to policies, and they does not necessarily comply with the policy because policy is very in inadequate in compared to the um, local situation. That's why they just, they create their, their own mechanisms. So they have their own strategies to make sure to secure they have access to resources. And unfortunately, most of these policies are very incompatible and heavily based on agrarian based um, property rights and land issues. That's why it's very ineffective in pastoral land management. And also, in land law, herders' conditional and ambiguous property rights status lead to a diversifi diversification of access strategies and patterns. So basically, land law is full of gap, and then it has a lot of ambiguity in it. So herders have use, management use and access right to campsites, but they do not necessarily have clearly defined property rights to land. And then herder group is trying, herder group territory is trying to replace that property rights, but it does not necessarily meet with the local situation regarding their movements and climate and campsite possessions and all, the, all those things. So that's why a lot of these policies being ambiguous and implementation is really ineffective. And so, this kind of situation creates very complex institutional con condition in Mongolian pastoral land situation. So it actually led to environmental outcome. So one word I'd like to conclude is basically, I think going through all these um, literatures and research and case study and field works, all these environmental outcomes is not necessarily herders having too many livestock and then they're overgrazing and then they are degrading land. It's not necessarily that. Actually, there are much more complex reasons behind it, which is mainly related to the legal policy issues. So that's all. Thank you.